All right, all right. That's a good spot, Holly. I think people can, people can barely see Holly here. <laughs> they can barely see you, but they can see you. Okay, all right. Welcome to Hort Tube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video uh, that I typically do on Sundays. I actually did one this past uh, Wednesday, but most Sundays you can ask questions down below and I'll answer them. Uh, I'll pick from those and answer them in uh, next week's uh, video. Uh, there's a playlist on the channel called question and answer if you go back and look at that. Um, I've answered a lot of these uh, questions uh, over the uh, years of this channel and there's, I don't know, there's 80 or 90 uh, uh, question and answer videos at this point. I put the chair over here. I don't know if you guys will be able to see. It depends on probably what you're watching this on, uh, how many bees are behind me on all these salvias and agapanthus here. And Holly likes laying out here in the grass. Um, let's get started on some of the questions that I got from either Wednesday or um, last Sunday. Uh, somebody got uh, a new limelight hydrangea and it has some small holes uh, in the leaves. Um, in all likelihood, that was flea beetles, um, which is really a, a nursery issue, which well, this will sound like a weird answer. Uh, uh, flea beetles uh, have become the nurseryman's biggest pest. Uh, it's, a, it's an insect that can live in the um, soilless media that we use in the containers, so the pine bark and sand mixes that we use in the containers. Uh, they, can lay their, they can lay their eggs there, and they can live their entire life cycle by overwintering and living in the pot during the day and then feeding on the plants uh, in the evening and at night. A real nightmare for nurserymen. I, 15 years ago or so, it showed up at my nursery on some Itea or Virginia Sweet Spire. I actually thought for a little while it was an insect that only ate Virginia Sweet Spire because it was the only thing in the nursery that was on and then slowly but surely it jumped to other uh, plants. Hydrangea paniculata, very high on their list. Uh, limelight is a hydrangea paniculata, very high on their list. Uh, but weirdly, it's a nursery problem. Um, you plant the plants in the ground and you really don't see them. There's some flea beetles here and there on some, um, I know some far farmers have some issues with them. They have particular soil types where flea beetles can survive, but uh, for the most part, uh, it's a nurseryman's issue. And it's a real nightmare because most nurserymen are pretty good environmentalists. I call nurserymen accidental environmentalists because number one, you have to save your water because we need water. And so we're trapping all the water on the property. So the chemicals and the fertilizers and that kind of thing are being trapped on the property and being allowed to break down and that kind of thing without running out into the environment. And then we use fertilizers that last nine months. And it's mainly just because we don't want to be fertilizing all the time, but those slow release fertilizers are also good for the environment. And then uh, chemical wise, it costs money to spray chemicals. So most, most nurserymen are going out shaking the leaves on things before they make make plans to spray. They're not most, the, the vast majority of them aren't spraying to be spraying because it's expensive. And, uh, but flea beetles have come along and really uh, been a nightmare for the nursery industry. And uh, it doesn't matter where I go. I can go to the nicest nursery in America and I can find flea beetle damage somewhere on the property despite their best efforts at whatever control methods that they're using. Um, and so that's what it is. It's not an issue for you, but if you go to a nursery and you see little holes in some leaves on some plants uh, and you don't see insects actually on that plant, in all likelihood it's flea beetles. When you put it in the ground, it's just a non-issue. But for whatever reason, um, again, uh, well, I know the reason, that soilless media allows them to survive and breathe uh, in, that, uh, in that container. Uh, but that's what it is. It's just no big deal for you, a uh, nightmare for a uh, nurseryman. Uh, some, the same person asked, they got some reblooming daylilies that haven't rebloomed. They just put them in the ground this year. Uh, I can answer half the questions I get with this answer, which is the first year you put something in the ground, um, don't worry about it <laughs> so much. Uh, being uh, repeat blooming things are likely not to repeat bloom the first year. That would include Encore azaleas, repeat blooming hydrangeas, um, uh, daylilies doesn't matter it doesn't matter what it is it's not going to perform the best it's ever going to perform the first year you put it in the ground and those that paranoia over newly planted things is what will lead you to overwater things um, and to overspray things and over fertilize things and just you know being overly concerned about it you know i had one one question where it was i got a couple of yellow leaves on something what should i do you know pull the yellow leaves off and go have you know go enjoy the rest of your day that's the answer to it. Um, uh, but again, first year you put something in the ground, you know, as long as it's alive, um, it's rooting in. All the work that needs to be done in the first year is happening underground, not on the top. 
that's probably a good way to answer that from now on. Uh, somebody bought a Grand Cascade butterfly bush, this one that I have uh, over here, it'll be in a tour video this week. Uh, and it's thin down at the bottom and they wanted to know if it would ever fill out or should they just underplant it. Uh, it's probably only tall and stretched because it was in a nursery and the pots were close together and so the plants race for light and that tends to thin things out a little bit. But you need to you should be pruning your butterfly bush in the late winter, early spring before it wakes up or as it's starting to wake up uh, next spring anyway and that pruning that you do on it. I'd prune the thing down to 18 inches tall. Uh, in February or March and uh, that process of pruning it will fill it back out and it'll look like a completely different plant on a year-to-year -year basis because of your winter pruning uh, and let's see somebody wanted a zone 8 conifer that only gets about six feet tall I, I don't really know I know that if you're in zone 8 in the southeast where it's hot uh, junipers are probably your best friends um, that's you know I would consider using something like blue point but blue point can get 15 feet tall but you could keep it six or eight feet tall for the next 20 years um, I would avoid arborvita. the the problem the problem with conifers is that if this person was asking me for zone 8 and they were in Washington State along the coast somewhere um, the whole world of conifers is open to them if they're in zone 8 in Atlanta um, you know where it's quite normally quite a bit hotter I know this summer's been weird so far but uh, where it's normally hotter, then it's a very limited number of conifers that work really well and stay small. I mean, there's a lot of conifers that'll grow there, but they're things that, you know, sc you know scotch pines and you know, things that get ginormous, uh, Arizona cypress and that kind of thing. But a small growing cone-shaped conifer, I would probably lean toward a juniper. Uh, most of them are gonna try to get taller than that, but they should be pretty easy. So go to a garden center and ask them, you know what upright junipers they have but they tend to be the toughest plants in our heat okay um somebody asked me i don't know why but they asked me if i had ever grown poet, poet's laurel yeah i grew poet's laurel at my old nursery i probably will end up with a spot here somewhere uh with a poet's laurel um before it's over with um i am running a little thin on space but uh i have saved some gaps here and there and it is, it is a great it is a great plant uh okay uh just in response to my talking about having a closed loop system on this property next year and not, not bringing anything in, like bringing in mulches or bringing in fertilizer, I'm going to bring in seeds and I'll probably buy a few annual plants that I can't do from seeds. So I will be bringing a few things onto the property, but I'm not going to bring mulch or fertilizer. And I just want to show you, I can make this just as lush. Um, and the, uh, uh, so somebody at, what I'm going to do is take the organic material that's coming out of the ground um, from these cycles of growing from my vegetable garden and from the shrubs and trees, I'm going to grind them and then I'm going to compost them. All the leaves that fall off the trees on this property behind me that fall in here, they will become my mulch. And uh, uh, that, that, that's, that's the way that will go, you know, will happen. I haven't been here really long enough, I don't think, to pull this off next year i just don't have enough big shrubs um you need a lot of biomass to do what i'm talking about to uh you know because i want to probably add three or four inches over the course of the year to this all of these bed spaces in order to feed uh the microbes the way i want to feed them i don't know if i have enough biomass yet and by biomass i mean things that i can cut off of plants you know and then turn into compost um and uh use that uh to feed the um uh, you know the, the the soil biology what's interesting um you know the other part of the you know some of the questions i got about it you know is will i fertilize no i don't have to fertilize because um the uh, mycorrhizal fungi will take care of that for me most all of these plants i mean i think it's something like 90 percent of all plants that may be an overestimate um maybe an underestimate i don't know have a mycorrhizal fungi relationship uh, these plants aren't on their own out here um this uh it, this red bud that sits here behind me has a mycorrhizal fungi uh, relationship it's the roots under the ground have a fungi attached to them which is turning the minerals in the soil because keep in mind soil is just ground up rock and and it's you know it's full of minerals but those minerals aren't available to those plants so the mycorrhizal fungi brings water to the tree when it's dry if it goes out further than the roots can and brings back water to the tree 
and makes minerals available in an available way to the to the tree and so and in exchange for that the mycorrhizal fungi gets the sugars that are created from um, the, what the trees capturing sunlight and turning it into sugars and so it's a relationship that works together but mycorrhizal fungi is basically raising that tree and so all I got to do is feed them and they um, you know those uh, that soil that soil just needs to stay covered and um, have a humus layer on it so I can use all this biomass uh, in this yard to keep that soil covered and those mycorrhizal fungi will do everything else that I need doing not always possible everywhere because some soils are lean in certain things and you know you may live in an area where there's just no phosphorus or there's no no something and it has to be added um, I'm pretty lucky that my soil's pretty well balanced going into this and so and that's going to be you know a good portion of the southeast uh, where this would be uh, fairly easy to do literally just keep the ground covered I mean what's fertilizing the woods here behind me the thing that's fertilizing the woods is the is the limbs and the leaves and the sticks and the a dead animals and the animal poop and everything else that's falling onto the forest floor and then it's breaking down over time it's feeding the 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 fungi and the bacteria that are in the soil and those things are making nutrients available for the plants and that's the process by which you know humans don't have to go in the woods and start fertilizing the trees uh, that would be a that would be kind of a weird thing i think i'm going to move the camera around because the sun is now right here on my uh, forehead you're going to come back over here now see i gotta stay on the camera come here come here come here girl come here girl good girl good girl but that's really the, the you know that that's that's really what a closed loop is all about literally i'm just going to keep the ground covered uh and uh and let everything else take care of itself. Now the containers will be a different story because containers, um, they're kind of on their own. I mean, there might be some mycorrhizal fungi in those containers, but probably a very limited amount. So, you know, I may fertilize containers. I don't know how, I don't know how strict by the book um, I'll be for the entire landscape, but certainly all the things in the ground, uh, I will not need to fertilize next year um, because I've got everything underway. I jump started and cheated the system a little bit because I put down about an inch of compost on this entire yard. So I basically created uh, what would have probably taken 10 years of mulch breaking down, you know, to build that humus layer. And so, um, and then I've been mulching on top of that ever since. The soil's come a long way very, very quickly. Again, I cheated the system a little bit by putting down a fairly thick layer of compost on the on top of the soil i didn't till it in i don't incorporate it it's just sitting on the top same as it would be in the wooded area back here and uh, it does all the things that i've been saying forever that mulch does which is you know keep the soil cool or keep the soil warm or keep the soil moist and really at the end of the day it's just feeding microbes that are actually feeding our plants and uh, that's what keeps everything looking this lush but anyway that's the, that's the way it works and again i constantly say that i believe that things are being over fertilized the only reason that i would need to fertilize more than i'm fertilizing now is if i was doing things to harm the soil um you know um, letting it become naked uh would be a prime example of that uh, but as long as again as long as i'm bringing that in that's the most important thing is what i did here to the soil first um that makes it so lush that makes everything grow like this uh, and then i don't push them with man-made fertilizers or you know or any other fertilizers because i've talked about uh, pushing things with lots of nitrogen uh, will will lead to more insect problems and it's not like what i'm without any insect problems back here but i probably have far less than others would have in a similar garden if they were pushing things the way they're pushing them. Somebody said they were really confused because somebody was shut telling them they needed to fertilize their annuals or whatever in their pots, you know, once a week with liquid fertilizers. I just put plant tone on all these containers one time, uh, you know, and that, and that was it. I'm gonna do it again. I, I will do my containers twice a season and the vegetable garden. Uh, I'll fertilize again with plant tone or garden tone or something like that. So I'm using the same, you know, I'm using organic fertilizers uh, every time. I just think that it's just more I feel like if somebody worked at a garden center, like I, I like, so I worked at a garden center from 1986 until 2000, until no, 1986 until 1992. 
If I'd have walked out into the world from that garden center work, I would have thought that everybody needed seven items um, to go home and plant the plant with. Because in a garden center, somebody comes in for five plants and your job is not just to sell them five plants, it's also to sell them a shovel, uh, planting implement, you know, uh, 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 soil amendments, uh, fertilizers. Maybe I can get them to buy a chemical sprayer for, for an insect they don't even have yet. Uh, uh, go ahead and sell them a chemical, maybe a measuring cup, uh, three bags of fertilizer. Do they need to do their lawn? It's lawn season. Uh, they got to go home a grass seed too. So that was my job. So I would have walked out of any garden center job, I think, thinking that you needed a lot more things than you actually need. <laughs> <laughs> to you know to to pull off a pretty nice uh pretty nice garden uh, i think that if you push you know if you see a video where somebody is telling you they're using liquid fertilizer on a con on something every week you're probably on the same channel going to see how i'm controlling insect problems in those same containers those are basically the same video that's all i'm saying okay uh, somebody said their cone flowers are struggling uh, constantly. I would try to mix in some permatill or some expanded slate in with them. After going over to, uh, uh, after going over to uh, Denny Werner's house and, you know, I did that, uh, his favorite plant video and I've shown his garden a couple of times. He's got a lot of his, um, a lot of his cone flowers are planted in permatill. I just wonder if, if you're planting cone flowers the first year and they look great and then they're a lot less when they come back the next year. I'm wondering if you have vole issues, potentially have vole issues or some sort of root rot issue even, uh, and permatill or some sort of expanded slate may help with that. I used it in my Daphne planting video. I did mix that slate in with the uh, with those, but it's like, it creates permanent drainage, but it'll also prevent voles from uh, getting to the base of your cone flowers. It's just a guess uh, that that could be a problem. Uh, let's see. Um, Somebody asked if they could plant that Golden Falls red bud near their foundation. Yeah, I think it wouldn't be a problem. I don't think that thing's going to hurt your, uh, uh, I don't think it would hurt the foundation um, and probably less than a lot of the things that other people use. I mean, hollies have giant root systems on them after they're 20, 25 years old, more so than that thing's probably going to have. Somebody asked me my opinions on rubber mulch. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I would never use rubber mulch. I understand the, one of the benefits of rubber mulch is obviously you can use it in a playground setting and uh, it keeps kids safer, you know, because if they fall into that rubber, they're less likely to get hurt. So I kind of understand that application. The home use application, I have no idea. I have no idea why you would. It's in the southeast where we're getting rainfall, the rubber mulch will be the exact same as, as, as rock. When you put gravel or something as mulch, because we get rain, because we have squirrels and birds and, and weeds coming up through it and everything else, eventually that you'll see, start to see, it almost looks like the rock is disappearing into the soil and there's soil coming on top of it. And you have just as many weeds. Uh, it's a very, it, what, it seems like a long-term fix, but it's not. Out west, it probably is a long-term fix because they don't get as much rain and they don't have as much just the soil being turned over in those beds uh, to, to damage it. I would imagine the rubber mulch would be the exact same thing. I think, yes, it'll last 80 years in the soil, but I think it's gonna end up just buried in the soil uh, over, over time. So uh, no, uh, no for me anyway. Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know anything about it, honestly. I don't know if it's an all natural rubber. If it is, then it would, what are you doing? Um, then it would break down over some period of time, but, uh, uh, or if it's synthetic rubber. I don't know anything about it. I wouldn't use it. Um, and I don't think it's as long lasting as you think. I don't think there is a long lasting solution in, the, in areas where it rains uh, for a mulch. Okay, uh, somebody asked me about, um, is pampas grass have aggressive roots? Uh, yeah, uh, most, most larger growing grasses have very aggressive roots. I don't know where you are that you're planting pampas grass. Of all the pampas grass I ever sold, of all the pampas grass I've ever seen bought, of all the pampas grass I've ever seen planted, I couldn't find a good pampas grass within six miles of where I'm at. So I don't, um, you know, they have other issues. Uh, you know, those things can get giant and then they rot in the middle. They're d impossible to get out of the ground. I would just warn people against pampas grass in general. It's a noxious weed out on the West Coast. It's part of, you know, part of their fire issue um, is pampas grass in some areas in Southern California. Um, that grass burns like mad 
and it uh, and it burns hot. Uh, and it's you know I know it's one of the uh, w one of the pieces of a uh, uh, missing missing the word missing the word in, in my mind right now. But it's a you know it's like fuel. Um, it's fuel for some of those fires uh, on the west coast where it's become a noxious weed. Uh, so I would avoid it just period because you will have pampas grass regret uh, even if it goes well the first few years. Okay, a few more here. Um, somebody asked me how to permanently lower their pH and I, there's, you can't really, uh, unfortunately, permanently lower it. Sulfur is probably the best thing uh, to lower it, but it will always come back to the middle. So if you're going to use sulfur, know that it's going to be on some sort of pattern. So you'll continue to check your pH. You might be able to use sulfur and lower your pH from seven and a half to six and a half or six, and then check it again 12 months later and it's cre you'll see that it's creeping back up again. So you'll have to reapply it. Uh, but permanently, there's pretty much no way um, to change it. You know, you'd have to replace all the soil probably. Uh, somebody has said they had two live oaks and they're growing very differently. One is kind of formal looking and one has kind of got weeping limbs, I would imagine. Um, Live oaks are grown um, from um, from seed, and so or, you know from 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 acorns, likely, and so they have different. Um, there's some biodiversity in them, and so you're not going to get clones uh, on live oaks. Typically, uh, you would uh, it would be you won't see two that are the same ever. I mean, there you know some of them you'll see you know coming from right from the base where they're uh, split and you know seven or eight pieces are coming up right from the base and others you'll see with some sort of stem and then you know all the limbs just coming right down to the ground you know I just see a lot of different versions of it and I would imagine that that's what it is is what you're seeing is the biodiversity in using acorns <laughs> to create to create trees uh, that, that, that's my guess somebody has a couple more somebody said they have a container their dahlias that they planted in containers are wilting every afternoon, despite the fact that the soil is moist. Uh, that's, dahlias grow super aggressively uh, during the uh, growing season. And I would imagine what's happening is you've got too much material up here and not enough area for root system down here. And so the sun is basically taking more water out between the plant trying to grow and the sun taking water out of it during the middle of the day. Um, it can't keep up. The roots can't possibly, despite having water, they just don't have enough. Um, the pipes are undersized <laughs> in the container for what they need to have on the top. So you got half inch pipes down here and you need, you know, one inch pipes supplying the water and that's where you're at. I would try to pot them into slightly larger pots if you could, or alternatively during the absolute heat of the day, maybe a couple hours, you can put some sort of shade cloth over them and that will probably prevent some of that, uh, some of that water loss uh, to, that happens just from the direct sun, you know, stealing water out of the plant. What you doing? Uh-uh. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Have you been over here eating? Have you been over here eating grass or something? What you been doing? What have you been doing this whole time? This is what you've been doing. Is this what I'm gonna see when I go edit this? Is you eating grass? Why are you eating grass? All right. One last question here before I uh, wrap this one up. Um, if, I, if I'm short on questions next week, I'll go back and grab more. There's been so many good questions um, answered uh, in the uh, first three of these uh, so far this year, um, or so far this summer. So thanks again for your participation. Somebody asked why I sold my nursery. Uh, I'm in uh, Wake County, uh, which is where Raleigh is uh, right now. This is where I grew up. Uh, this is where I went to high school and college and everything else. Uh, but where I raised my son was in a county called Johnston County. It's just to the southeast of Wake County. Uh, it's a farm. It was a farm community and uh, not so much uh, anymore. It's become just a suburb of Raleigh and just it had rapid, rapid development going on. Still does. Uh, we have towns around Raleigh. If you any of these southeastern cities, if you come to Raleigh or you come to Charlotte or you come to Atlanta, uh, it's not just Atlanta that's growing. It's the city of Alpharetta, Georgia, that's just, been, you know, Snellville and all the cities around, around there and around Charlotte, it's the same thing. All the cities around Charlotte have just, Concord and others have just blown up into giant cities. Here in Raleigh, we have, a, we have what was a little town called Cary, where almost no people lived when I was in, way back in the 80s. And now 
there's like near 200,000 people or something living in Cary, North Carolina. It's right here. Anyway, Johnston County was the same, and uh, people were farming houses more than they're farming anything else. And uh, I decided to, um, you know, let a developer, uh, let a developer deal with that space, and uh, and then I short. Uh, Maybe kept the garden center open another year uh, after that and uh, just kind of realized I was overworking Saturdays. I had done it for so long that um, I was just kind of over it. But I'm still here answering gardening questions uh, just like then. Uh, I just don't necessarily, you know, have to be, uh, you know, at the garden center for eight hours. Uh, you know, I can, I can do it when I want to do it. So there you go. Thank you guys for uh, watching and following along, asking questions, participating on the channel. Uh, I'll continue the uh, tour videos back into the uh, backyard garden space uh, this week. Thanks for watching.